Of all the animals to earn the title Maneater, the shark terrifies us like no other. Rising from the deep dark, silent. I didn't say it coming at all. Fast. I couldn't stop it. Powerful. Like a torpedo hitting your leg and just clamping on. Random. He got in the way of a Jewfish and a shark. But shark attacks are changing. A diver has been killed by a great white shark. Hunt is underway off our coast for a killer shark. Police say there is no hope of finding a father of two alive. In 2020, eight people were killed by sharks in Australian waters. Most years, the average is one person. Coincidence? Possibly not. One of the things about climate change is that it's predicted to affect the different species of sharks quite differently. Now researchers are wondering if the rules are changing. They are getting smarter and they are learning our patterns and they're just taking advantage of it. And sharks are setting the terms. They're a large marine apex predator. They're not just staying local, but they're going up to 40,000 kilometres off the east coast and west coast of Australia. These are the shark stories of 2020. Realised later that was the artery that was severed. And a reminder that we swim in their realm, not them in ours. A diver has been killed by a great white shark off the coast of Esperance. It's a horrific start to the year for Esperance Emergency Services. The community is devastated by the loss of Gary Johnson. The year was only five days old when the first news reports broke of a fatality in Western Australia. The call came just after one this afternoon, a man bitten by a great white shark as he scuba dived off Cull Island. Shark attacks always generate headlines, but this one was particularly gruesome because Gary's dive buddy was his wife, Karen. The couple had just started their scuba dive. At around seven metres deep, the great white attacked. I'm half a person, my other half's not here. I never will be again. We retrieved a dive tank, as well as his BCD vest that he wore at the time. They've been damaged, obviously, as a result of, of shark attacks. It was calm, it was clear, it was beautiful. But something about it seemed really odd. A prescient comment, something was odd, because since January 5, 2020, swimmers, divers, fishermen, and scientists have reported similar findings. Sharks are changing, attacks are increasing, and no one understands why. I couldn't swim back to the boat because the wind was too strong, so I was hoping that maybe we could get his body. 12 months on, Gary's friends and family held a memorial dive at the location in his honour. However, one disturbing puzzle remains. Gary was wearing a shark shield, an electric device that deters the predators. He may not have switched it on, or he may have just met a shark who didn't care much for shields. Less than two weeks later, on the other side of the country, another attack. It's summer in Australia. There's more people in the water, so more chance of attacks. Fortunately for victim Will Schroeter, the shark that bit him was curious, not hungry. I grew up here, you know, I just, I just love the water. That's where I want to be. I was always aware of sharks being there. And because of my fishing background, um, I sort of knew where they would be, how they feed. My waters around where I surf, day in, day out, hardly ever hear of a shark attack. And my wife had a dream a couple of days before, you know, I saw you get, get attacked by a shark and went, oh, don't want to hear it. So I sort of said, oh, yeah. I just shrugged it off and kept doing what I was doing. But that was always in the back of my mind. 
Well, I had a dream a couple of nights before about Will being out surfing on a dark, cloudy morning. I've had dreams like that, where, and just a sense of dread where something bad's going to happen. And this was just one of those dreams. So he was laying on his surfboard, and I could just see the panic in his face, and then just blood all around the surfboard. So Tim, I, I really don't want you to go. The weather was bad, it just didn't feel right. But he said, oh, there hasn't been an, a shark attack here for 40 years, you know, 50 years. It's not going to happen. He has told me since that when he got in the water, he did have this funny feeling like something was going to happen. Will and his neighbour, Peter, paddled out across the mouth of the lake to go around the breakwater at the south end of Windang Beach, heading to a spot locally known as Sharkies. It was like the last of the run-out tide. And because of the rain through the night, I knew all the marine life and that would be getting flushed out to sea. So I was a bit more wary that, that day of, you know, sharks being around. We paddled out sort of through the lake entrance and, and had a look at, at Sharkies, which is a break that sort of just sits out a bit in front of the, the lake entrance. And, and there wasn't much happening there, so we paddled in towards the, the shore break on the beach. That's when I got my first wave. Caught my first wave, rode it in, I thought, oh, well, I'm happy. Will sort of stayed pretty close to where the break wall was, and uh, I could see a cleaner break a little bit further up the beach, so I paddled over to that. Will was about 150 metres from the shore and a long way from anyone else. He didn't see it coming. There was no warning. No warning at all. And it was just like a jolt. A bit like a torpedo hitting your leg and just clamping on. Basically, my whole foot went in the shark's mouth, straight in. Went a bit and it shook, just like a jolt. It shook. It just felt like the top part of the shark's jaws, the gums just rubbing. No teeth, didn't feel the teeth, just these blunt gums trying to saw through my foot. And then it just released. And then I knew, you know, I just instantly just saw it. This is And I just turned around and just went, you. just hear him yelling and I could see him sort of throwing his arms and I'm thinking I didn't really know what he was yelling out. So uh, I thought it was quicker for me to paddle, catch a wave and get to the beach and then run up the beach to see what was going on. Will realised that the shark might still be around and he knew he had to get out of the water. I thought of the second attack. You know, I looked out behind me, thought survival, you know, I just got to lay it on your board started paddling, then I was thinking, don't get excited, like, fish and sharks, they like the splashing, that type of thing, so I just composed myself, just kept paddling, paddling, and then I was thinking about my foot, feeling my toes, and I could feel my small toe was curled over, and I knew something's definitely wrong there. Incredibly, Will managed to paddle 150 metres into shore. He was paddling in himself, I could see all the blood and that in the water around him, so I sort of got in a little bit and helped him out. The shark had got in pretty good. I could see when his heart was beating, it was blowing a lot of blood out. The shark had bitten Will's foot down to the bone, severing arteries and tendons. It's a long paddle in, and I could imagine how much he bled out in the water. To paddle in himself, he did a great job got a phone call and it was a policewoman and I knew what she was going to say before she even said it. She said, there's been an accident. Your husband's been bitten by a shark. It's pretty bad. My dream just came back to me. But this was actually happening to us. When I came to the hospital, my wife was there. My kids were there. 
you know, and even now, I sort of... I just still get emotional from it. The doctor managed to save Will's foot, but it was four months before he ventured back into the water, this time on a paddleboard. Oh, I was happy. Happy that I was standing on my board. But when I fell in, I got up really fast. If I had that dream again of him going surfing, I would definitely uh, crash tackle him and stop him from going out the door. <laughs> Science shows that your risk of being bitten by a shark is increased if you're swimming anywhere near a river mouth. Swimming in the summer months, the warmer waters, you know, November, December, January. And also if you're swimming or surfing um, after a significant period of rain. Great whites, bull sharks and tiger sharks, they're responsible for the majority of um, shark bites along our, our New South Wales coast and, and, and throughout Australia as well. The one thing that sharks are very good at is being a predator. They are an exquisite predator. They've been around for about 600 million years and so that's a lot of time to get it right. And to be honest, they haven't changed that much over that time. However, as we will discover, though primitive, sharks can learn and change behaviour. In April 2020, Queensland Parks and Wildlife Officer Zach Robber was swimming with three other rangers after a day's work. He was one week into his dream job. A desperate race to save a young man's life. This male person was the last person to get out of the water as he was about to get on the boat. Bitten on both his legs, his torso and his arm, Zach was flown to Gladstone Hospital but couldn't be saved. Twenty twenty will forever be known as the year of the shark. By May, two people were dead, three bitten, and one lucky spear fisherman had a chunk taken out of his swim fin. He later identified his attacker as a 1.5 metre bull shark. In June, Rob Pedretti was surfing at a popular break near Kingscliff. Good evening, a hunt is underway off our coast for a killer shark that mauled a 60-year-old surfer. A friend and a stranger fought off the Great White and managed to pull the surfer out of the water. There was a big gutter um, between the beach and where the surf was. There was a gutter, and in that gutter there's fish. So whether or not it was, you know, getting fish, I don't know. But it was definitely hanging around that spot. So the two guys that brought him in said that was quite harrowing. They said paddling over the gutter was quite horrifying and, you know, because they were trying to hang on to Rob and paddle and the shark's still hanging around. So it, it was, you know, it didn't bite and take off. It, it, it hung around and these guys all the way in, it was, you know, circling them. It's an amazing feat, you know, people say, they use the word hero a lot and they were so humble. They said, oh, that's just what you do. After an attack, it's generally possible to move a shark away from the area. But this time was different. Yeah, I mean, as an untrained shark person, I would think that that, that particular shark, that was their territory. They weren't moving on for anybody. There were two uh, Surf Lifesaver jet skis out there chasing it, and it wasn't very happy with them at all. And it had no concerns whatsoever about the boat obviously aggressive. For over an hour, that four metre great white held its ground. But that shark wasn't going anywhere until it wanted to leave. It was just there. Barely a month later, another headline. Off the stunning coast of Fraser Island, spear fisherman Matt Tratt was well used to sharing the ocean with sharks. 
But on July 4, he met a shark that didn't want to share. My brother had actually had some prior encounters with sharks. He knew the risks and he was quite aware of them. The risk is part of the reward. It was only two years earlier, he caught his biggest fish off the same rocks. Keen spear fisherman Matt Tratt told his brother Rob about the two close encounters he'd had with sharks in early 2020. The first was with a bull shark off the Gold Coast. He got buzzed by a bully. So buzzed by a bully means that the, the shark comes in, investigates you, and then just zips off. And he saw the shark coming, put the spear gun up, and when the shark was nearly at the tip of the spear gun, it, it, it zipped off. A couple of weeks later, he came close to a white shark near Caloundra in southeast Queensland. He dived down and he saw this huge shape. And he looked and he was like, wow, that's a shark. And then he was like, hang on a second. That's the biggest shark I've ever seen. So that's a white pointer. In July, Rob and Matt took their families to Fraser Island off the coast of Queensland. We've been going to Fraser Island since I was four years old. We swam in the water there. We, we were never concerned of sharks. The reality is that the likelihood of getting attacked by a shark is extremely rare. So rare, in fact, that no one had ever been fatally attacked by a shark on Fraser Island until Matt. It was a perfect clear day, and Matt and Rob decided to jump off the rocks at Indian Head to go spearfishing. That's where he's caught his biggest fish, which was like a 28, 29 kilo Spanish mackerel. So he was pretty keen to get in the water and, um, and fish in your head. Rob vividly remembers what happened next as he watched his brother Matt waiting for a large school of dewfish to swim past. He just glided down and he was just there poised, just as still as anything, just poised, waiting. There's a turtle in the water. I can hear the whales going off. We've got huge stingrays. This is just fantastic and beautiful. And then I looked down to the right and I saw these two huge dewfish. And I dived down. And as I'm diving down, I hear the of his spear gun go off. Rob surfaced, and that's when it happened. I poke my head out of the water and I just hear my brother just go, shark attack. He goes, Rob, I've been bit. I've been bit by a shark. And I'm like, how bad? And he goes, it doesn't look good. And I look over and I just see this big billow, billow of blood. I'm just swimming for the rocks now and he's, he's like ahead of me a little bit. I swim around behind him and there's just blood in the water everywhere. I, I can't even see in the water like, a, you know, I, I've already tried to have a look, make sure the shark's not coming for me. And then I look back and he's like, he's just face down in the water and I realise he's motionless. He's, he's like, he's like drowned, like he's full of water or something. And I just dive over there and I, and I just turn him over and I'm like, breathe, Matt, breathe. And like, he just looked at me, he rolled his eyes and he looked at me and I, I just know that he just said to me, tell my wife and kids I love them. And, uh, and his eyes just roll back in the back of his head. I felt the life go out of my, my brother in my hands. The report came back from the coroner that it was um, a 2.8 metre bull shark. Um, bull sharks typically max out at three metres. After a certain size, they just start getting wider. 2.8 metres might sound small when you compare it to like a, a four metre great white, but that's a, that's a large bull shark and they're very aggressive. So what does Rob think happened that day? He got in the way of a jewfish and a shark. You know, so it wasn't even going for him. It was going for to put a jewfish on the end of the spear gun. Six months later, Rob takes comfort from a conversation Matt had with their mum just two weeks before his death. My mum posed the question. She said, what will you do if a shark takes you? And he just said to her, he said, I've taken plenty of fish out of water. If a shark takes me out of the water, that's the circle of life. Matt Tratt, 
was only 36 when he died, but the next shark fatality was even younger. Manny Hart Deville was surfing an unpatrolled beach north of Coffs Harbour with his mates. It happened so quickly, with such force, the boys left thigh badly lacerated by a shark bite. Information we have, it's quite probably a two and a half metre white pointer. Friends of the 15-year-old worked frantically to stop the bleeding. For an animal that is so feared, what's surprising is how little is known of these apex predators. But the New South Wales Department of Primary Industries' Paul Butcher is determined that sharks and people stay firmly separated. The tagging and tracking program is, is one of the biggest components and uh, we're mainly after white sharks, tiger sharks and bull sharks. So we want to get a better understanding of where these animals are moving. What we're finding is that there's always sharks along our coast. And we're catching these animals anything from 500 metres off the coast or, or going offshore on our deep set set lines. We're also getting our bull sharks in the rivers and, uh, and even Sydney Harbour where we, we tag a lot of bull sharks. So what we're seeing here is all the white sharks that we've tagged on the New South Wales coast and actually where they've gone as a conglomerate group. So you can see here some moving across to, uh, to New Zealand, other sharks moving over to Western Australia. Here we have a, a bull shark that we've spotted from, from a drone as part of our research program. Um, we tag those animals and then get an understanding of where they've moved. So as you can see, not as far as the white sharks, but they're still tracking up and down the east coast of Australia. Shark tracking is one tool to help prevent shark attacks. The problem is you can't track all sharks all the time. Annika Craney has an unusual relationship with sharks. I first fell in love with sharks when I started scuba diving when I was a teenager and just fell in love with the feeling of being in the company of these creatures that get such a bad rep and then you get to see how graceful and beautiful they are and it's just a, an indescribably wonderful feeling. Annika spent most of 2020 crewing a dive boat in the Coral Sea and an island layover with some R&R &R in mind was a welcome break. Some of the crew went in for a swim, they went in for a snorkel, and we really thought it was a super safe place. Nothing like the really remote, crazy locations we'd been to prior to that. You know, we've been swimming with sharks and whales and all this amazing sea life, and well, this was only a few miles out of Cairns, close to the coast, it felt safe. Fitzroy Island is a popular tourist haunt just off Cairns. Locals here will tell of the dangers of deadly jellyfish and crocs. It hadn't been regarded as sharky until now. We swam up the end of the beach and realised there was the water was too murky to enjoy it and I just wasn't feeling easy. It just didn't feel right. Even in the really shallow water, it just didn't feel good. So we were on our way back to the boat when it happened. I saw the shark coming from the depths in front of me. I only had about three seconds to respond. I flipped my body around, put my fins in front of its face, it came up underneath and latched on to the lower half of my leg and through my fin, kicked it with my other leg, saw the blood kind of fill up in the water, and I started screaming for help. I hear this blood-curdling scream. You know, Annika was screaming, Dane, Dane, Dane! Annika was dragged by other swimmers onto the beach at nearby Fitzroy Island. I was really lucky that I was close to shore. There was a lot of blood that was the artery that was severed and continued to spurt when I was lying on the beach, which was why people were quite panicked that I was gonna bleed out. That's when we realised, you know, we did need to rush and get to the hospital as soon as possible. She was airlifted to Cairns Base Hospital within an hour of being bitten. 
It wasn't until I knew she was safe in the helicopter that I was able to process all that was happening to her. And to have one of our family, one of our crew bitten by a shark, it, it was a real shock to the system for all of us. So we turned the boat around, made our best speed back to Cairns, and we were pretty much by a hospital bed by that night. Never one to miss an opportunity to promote the ocean, Annika's heartfelt reaction to the bite went viral. I didn't kind of think what I was going to say. It just flooded out. <laughs> I still love sharks. That's so beautiful. And I just screamed at them. I still love sharks. They're beautiful. <laughs> and they all started laughing. And the paramedics that were carrying me into the hospital just hung their head and said, oh, that one's going to really take off. <laughs> you might regret that. The shark had bitten through her ankle deep enough to leave a tooth embedded in the bone. The bite signature identified the likely culprit as a bull shark. For Annika, a permanent love bite from the creatures she adores. My perspective on sharks hasn't changed. If anything, I feel a lot more passionate about changing people's minds. You do need to be aware of the risks, but I, I feel very passionate about protecting them. I still love sharks! That's so beautiful! The second half of 2020 had just begun. On July 17, in Tasmania, a large shark leapt out of the water and snatched a 10-year-old child out of a small open boat. The boy's father jumped into the water and the startled shark let the boy go. He survived with minor lacerations. An amazing tale to one day tell his grandkids. Also alive to tell his story, Phil Mummett, now known as the luckiest man in Dunsborough, Western Australia. Phil was out surfing the crystal waters of Bunker Bay, southwest of Perth, when he was attacked by a five metre great white. Bunker Bay is probably one of the most beautiful spots in the world, I would say. Big sweeping bay and nice clear water. I've been coming down here pretty much all my life. And just like any other day, Phil paddled out to his favourite break. Yeah, it was some good swell coming through. I was probably out for maybe half an hour or so. Had got a few good waves and kind of gone a bit flat. So I was killing time waiting for the next waves to come. But didn't happen. I heard someone call that shark, so I turned around and pretty much witnessed the whole thing. I just saw this head essentially in the water. I thought, oh, holy moly, you know, something's happened here. Then, then we got the glimpse of the, uh, the, the big fella. I didn't see it coming at all. The first thing that I knew was I was in the water. My board was bitten in half and there was this massive grey thing sitting right in front of my face. It was, its face was about here, pointed straight towards me. And so the back half of the board was still sitting next to me and I just grabbed that back half of the board and just started shoving it into its mouth. In my mind, I just, I wasn't gonna lose that fight. So it kind of let go and that's when it started circling me. And that was when it came around and that's kind of when I first realised just how big it was. And I could just say the size of it and the size of the dorsal fin was, you know, a metre tall. Yeah, they reckoned it was five metres. I've made a great white, which is pretty much as big as I get. I've just never seen a dorsal fin that big in my life. So, yeah, it was huge. And realised that, that, yeah, he was going to need some help. While all the other surfers hit the shore, heroically, Alex, Jess and Liam paddled over to where the massive shark was circling Phil. Um, instinct kind of took over and, and I think any time in life you see someone who needs help, you just help them, don't you? At that moment, you have a split second to make a choice. I just thought, well, here's a guy that is in need. It just made sense to paddle over there. As the guys headed to Phil, the shark was still trying to attack. I was trying to push it away with my hand, and it was just so solid. It just, it was like pushing a brick wall. 
and it would uh, circle around and then it would kind of come in for a, like a charge. It would charge at me, but just go past. Yeah, by the time I got there, I was just sitting there looking at him. Once Alex had him on the board, he had a chance to see how badly Phil was hurt. Kind of peered over and looked at the side of his leg and saw the extent of it and you could see it was a pretty severe wound, yeah. I had no idea that I'd been injured. I couldn't feel it at all. I just had so much adrenaline and shock that I guess it was just blocking out all the pain. By the time we got to the beach, I could feel that there was like something wrong. So I kind of looked back to have a look at uh, my leg. And yeah, that's when I saw that the wetsuit was ripped open. So yeah, that's, that's really when I knew that I had actually been injured. The shark had ripped a huge hole in Phil's upper thigh, too high to apply a tourniquet. So a good Samaritan jumped in and hand clamped the wound for 40 minutes until the ambos arrived. Yeah, the efforts absolutely saved me um, by putting, putting pressure on the wound, direct pressure, and yeah, helping to stem that bleeding. Yeah, saved my life for sure. So how's the leg going? Oh, mate. Six uh, months on, Phil still has the scars to show what happened that day. So there's kind of four major gashes. So there's one that kind of goes from my hip down kind of midway of my thigh. Then there's one below that midway to almost my knee. And then there's two smaller ones up on more of the front of my leg. I mean, just incredibly lucky that it didn't hit any major nerves. And this is the one where it's three centimetres from hitting my femoral artery which, yeah, basically, if, that, if it had cut that, I wouldn't have made it back to the beach. And yeah. Phil's surfboard is another stark reminder of that fateful day. <laughs> hey, dude. That's what they were trying to get the measurement off these ones. In this game of what, could have, what it could have been, is incredibly lucky. Phil Mullet was attack number 13 for 2020. Number 14, Chantel Doyle, also survived a bite at Shelley Beach, Port Macquarie. Only after her husband jumped on the back of the shark as it attacked her. A 35-year-old woman, the latest surfer to fall victim to a great white. Lurking in the pristine waters, a juvenile great white shark. Around 9.30, it attacked. Her husband leapt into action. He jumped on the shark's back, punching the predator repeatedly until it let go. That brave, selfless act probably saved her life. A question that won't be answered for years. Was 2020 an aberration for shark attacks or the beginning of a trend? Some experts fear the world's oceans are changing rapidly and sharks with them. Sharks have been around for hundreds of millions of years, so They've already adapted to previous change. We're heating up the world and we're causing massive changes in the marine environment. The anecdotal evidence from abalone divers and commercial fishing, yeah, their numbers have gone through the roof. It's been proven with encounters. It's been proven with attacks. How can you doubt that? There's not more people looking for sharks. There's more sharks. I don't know how to tell you this is a good thing or a bad thing, but actually they're way smarter than people give them credit for. Obviously, a shark hasn't got hands. When it wants to go up and investigate something, it has to get close. And if it wants to feel it, it has to feel that with its mouth. And of course, if that's a human swimming or surfing, that can cause some damage. Between climate change, increased numbers, and their ability to learn, there is a perfect shark storm happening. Add the fact there are more people in the water than ever before, and you begin to understand why attacks like the one on Nick Slater generate horror. White water erupts from the Greenmount surf. In a chilling moment, Nick Slater's life ends. He was floating next to his board. I think he was face down at the time as well and motionless. I just decided to make a move and do what I could. So I basically bolted around the footpath down to the beach it was only until I got close, a couple of metres away, that he yelled out, help, help, and um, I said, what, what can I do? And they said he's been bit by a shark. A suspected great white shark savaging the real estate agent's leg. The injury so severe, when help arrived, 
it was already too late. Uh, Nick himself was um, not really conscious. He was quite pale. We were still doing our best to, to get him to shore, but it felt like it was already too late. Despite everyone's best efforts, Nick couldn't be saved. We got him to the beach. Um, we tried to apply a tourniquet as best we could. It was already too late. He was gone by that point in time. After witnesses brought Nick through the shallows, paramedics and lifeguards did all they could, but their efforts were in vain. I was basically the last one standing on the shore and I noticed that his board was still floating in the water. So um, I walked over and flipped it over and that's when I noticed the, the bite mark and the tooth still wedged into the fiberglass. Part of the gum attached to the tooth was still intact. Bite mark on his surfboard and this tooth embedded in the fiberglass, evidence of the ferocity of the attack. It was an obvious white pointer tooth in my mind. Authorities are still hunting the three and a half metre great white thought responsible. When I first saw the body, there was a dark patch not far from him, and it was a, definitely a school of fish, and there was actually seabirds diving into that school. I believe that um, there was a school of fish came through the lineup, and the shark was following it. Most likely, the sharks just veered off and decided to have a bite at someone nearby. and. Uh, Sad fact that some, someone's life was taken at the same time. Australian surfers tend to be a pretty chill lot. Despite Nick Slater's death, local surfers were straight back in the water. But a little way south, and less than a week later, another surfer, Christian Bungate, stared death in the eye. I'd seen a bunch of sharks. We'd had times when we'd all be sitting there and someone would be like, far out, shark. And we'd pretty much just watch it go underneath us and then sort of, and then go away a bit, you know? We'd all lie down and lift our legs up, but it was just, yeah, it didn't really bother us a lot. But that all changed one day at Cabarita Beach in northern New South Wales. It was a beautiful day, the sun was out, waves were really fun. Couldn't have been a better afternoon, really. Christian was on his foil board about 100 metres off the shore. So the foil board's a little bit different than a normal short board. It's got a mast on it that's usually about 700 millimetres long. And it's got a front wing and it's got a back wing. So if you look at it, it looks a bit fishy or it looks a bit stingray-ish. So, you know, for that reason, the shark might come in and have a closer look. And that's exactly what happened. Been out in the water for about an hour. I'd had some really good waves and we were just sort of paddling back out. The shark came up next to me and I was lying down and I just kicked it as hard as I could to the side of me. Just kicked it. It was a great white and it was about four metres long and I reckon it was about 800 millimetres across this fully grown white shark would have weighed around a thousand kilos. So I just kicked it as hard as I could. It just turned left into my foil and just knocked me off my foil and I ended up being on top of the thing. I was, I was straddling, I was like on a horse but I was on the top of the bloody shark. Just for a brief instant before it took off. So this is actually the water surface where the board is. And the shark was obviously trying to come back in through to get me because I was behind this. My foil and my board were over in front of me and I probably saved my life. Because if I didn't have that mast and the wing, it would have just come back at me and taken my stomach out. The encounter left a deep impression on Christian and on his board. It came back and bit into the foil. So there's like a tooth in the front wing, yeah. My mates give me heaps of grief for riding one of these two, but now I'm blessed. I'm pretty happy with it. Most people who come up close and personal with a shark will live to tell the tale. Whether they go back in the water again is another story. By September 2020, six fatalities had already occurred and summer was yet to start. 
In Perth, surfer Sav Marafiotti was pulled off his board by a shark tugging on his leg robe. Sav survived. Four days later, Andrew Sharp wasn't so lucky. Police say there is no hope of finding a father of two alive after he was mauled by a great white in waters off Esperance yesterday. The only trace police found of Andrew was a surfboard and two shredded pieces of wetsuit. Andrea Hearn and her son were at the beach the day Andrew Sharp was taken by that shark. And her partner, Peter, was in the lineup. So Pete went out for a surf, and um, my son and I were in the water swimming. And it was about 20 minutes after Pete had gone into the water. And I could see six or seven surfers coming in. And one of them was Pete. And it was very unusual, because normally when you go out for a surf, you're out there for over an hour, a, a lot longer than 20 minutes. And they're all coming in on the same wave, and nothing had changed. Andrea suddenly realized what was going on when she heard another surfer calling out. So he was just yelling, shark, shark, get in, shark, shark. We looked out to the ocean, and you could see a couple of guys still in the water, and you could see Something big was in the water, and you could see it flashing. For the watchers on the beach, there was an horrific sense of disbelief. It was like it wasn't happening. It wasn't real life. So we were looking out to the ocean, and where we saw the splashing, you know, you could actually see the fin. It was very big. It was, wasn't a small shark, that's for sure. The two other guys came in, and you could then see Sharpie's board just floating in the water, and then the, and the, the, the shark was still splashing around. And it was a very, I guess, surreal sight. The beach was very somber. It, it, everybody was just shocked, and because no one could do anything. But nobody wanted to leave. There was a lot of hope on that beach that day. When the police came and the emergency services, I think that's when everybody realised that, you know, it wasn't much we could do. Sadly, Andrew's body was never found. They searched and searched, and they searched for days, but the ocean is a big, powerful thing, so who knows? His death has had a strong effect on the local surfing community. I think lots of guys who used to surf don't surf so much. We're all more aware. We've all, like, we've all got that shark smart now on our phones and check that before we go. It seems to be going off more often. I was out a couple of weeks ago and a seal popped up. And normally the guys would probably be, oh, it's just a seal, but they all just came in. So they're just more wary. And Andrea feels like that's probably justified. I mean, I moved here 14 years ago, and there was hardly any shark attacks that we knew of. Definitely got more and more. Oh, it's beautiful here. It's uh, very tropical, beautiful beaches. The reefs are absolutely stunning. I've been spearfishing now for 50 years. I have had close calls with sharks before, but uh, it hasn't been too many incidents and a shark get as close to me as, as here. Australia's Great Barrier Reef is one of the world's premier dive hotspots, normally safe and serene. But in October 2020, spear fisherman Rick Pachua learnt the reef's stunning looks can be deceiving. Oh, I started uh, spearfishing when I was about nine, and I decided to go in the Navy as a Navy diver at 17. I was the youngest Navy diver when I became a Navy diver. I stayed in Navy for uh, over 30 years, and when I retired, I was the oldest Navy diver. So uh, it was a good career. Yeah, every time I went somewhere to do a Navy job underwater, I got to take a spear gun, so I literally spearfished all around the world. Eventually, Love lured him to Australia. What brought me to Northern Queensland is uh, I married an Aussie girl, 
and she asked if uh, uh, I would move to Australia, and I said, as long as I get to pick the spot, so I picked this location based on spearfishing. I typically dive 60 to 100 days a year. I'm, I'm out on the reef quite a bit. On one of those trips out to the reef, Rick saved the life of his close friend and fellow diver, Glenn, when he was savagely attacked by a bull shark. It felt like I got hit by a freight train. I was violently shaken like a rag doll. I did not see the shark coming. All I felt was a massive amount of pressure and power shift me from my leg. And I just knew that, uh, yeah, I was being attacked by a shark. Rick was the man. Rick took control of the whole situation. He started kind of yelling demands at everyone what to do to, in order to save my life. To, and everyone just played their role. Glenn lost his leg in the attack. Not that it slowed him down. Glenn and Rick bonded over the event. Diving together, laughing together. <laughs> so imagine Glenn's reaction when he heard Rick's news. The man who had saved him was now a victim himself. I was in shock, major shock, for what we'd been through together as well. I just couldn't believe it. Rick and a couple of friends were out spearfishing at Brittermark Reef, 120 kilometers north of Townsville in far north Queensland. The water was just crystal clear. You could see 100 meters, e easy. It was their last fish for the day because the wind was coming up. I slowly swam down, and the moment I went click, the fish was dead. There was no wiggling, there was no blood. The moment that my gun made that noise click, my friend Peter saw the um, bull shark racing across the bottom which I couldn't see because I was on top of the ledge. It's moving very fast. And we just never see bull sharks moving fast. And if you do see a bull shark moving fast, something not good is going to happen. When it came straight over the ledge at me, it looked like it was doing 100 miles an hour. And uh, it was massive, maybe a, almost a meter across. And uh, it probably weighed 250, 275 kilos. And so uh, I smashed it as hard as I could with my spear gun, and I rolled to the right, and uh, it hit me, and that was quite a shock. It grabbed a hold of my left thigh, and uh, it bit twice in a fraction of a second, and then it spun 180 degrees, and it left the same direction that it came just as fast. And then this envelope of red blood started coming around me. Then the military kicked in and just get out of the water as quickly and, and uh, as calmly as you can. Rick managed to make it back to the boat and haul himself in with his friend Peter close behind. But he knew he didn't have long. He said very calmly, three minutes, Pete. And he said, three minutes for what, Rick? I said, three minutes to save my life. Take your weight belt off and put it on my thigh and get it as tight as you can. Luckily, a much faster boat was nearby with a doctor on board, but it took an hour and a half to get Rick back to shore, and he almost didn't make it. I was uh, pulseless, not breathing, and uh, had no blood in me by the time I got back. At Townsville Hospital, Rick was operated on immediately and put into an induced coma for four days. First thing I remember seeing was daylight. That was special. And then I reached down to feel my leg, and my wife, who was right to my left side of me, said, uh, you still have your leg. That was even more special. I spoke to my wife, and she said, what happened? My answer was, it was so fast, I couldn't stop it. And uh, I've been a waterman all my life, and I never thought I would be in that position. It just can't be stopped. It can't be prevented. If a, a full-grown bull shark is lit up and wants to attack, it's going to attack anything it wants. You cannot stop it. 
Rick is convinced shark behavior is changing. Sharks are learning a pattern that noise, maybe the noise of a boat, will bring them to a feed. Maybe the noise of a spear gun will bring them to a feed. So they are getting smarter and they are learning our patterns and they're just taking advantage of it. In late November 2020, the year's final fatality, Charles Chernobori was bodyboarding at Broome's famous Cable Beach when he was killed by what's presumed to be a great white. Nationwide, eight lives have been lost to the predators that rule the ocean, making 2020 the deadliest year in Australian waters in almost a century. A statistic that no one wanted to see. Eight dead, 12 injured. In December, two more injuries. The last at the same tourist beach where Charles Chernobori had been killed. Off the coast of Broome, in Western Australia. All the attacks were noted in the Australian Shark Attack Registry, but there were some attacks that didn't warrant inclusion on a formal list, but serve as a timely reminder that every shark is unpredictable. These two keen fishermen managed to capture a close encounter with a great white, just metres off their popular local surf beach south of Sydney. The day before I heard there was a dead whale with some tiger sharks on it. So the next morning, I'm gonna go snapper fishing in the area. And I thought it'd be a good idea. We're gonna stop in, see this whale carcass and see if there's any sharks. The carcass of a whale had washed up on the rocks and was attracting plenty of onlookers and sharks. It was early morning, we come in and people at the rocks they were pointing and we seen the whale carcass and then we went in for a look. Oh! Holy shit! <laughs> that is huge. And everyone's yelling on the rocks, going, behind you! We went over there, there was a big fin and tail splashing around. Holy f The biggest white I've ever seen. <laughs> oh my lord. Well, my boat's 5.3 metres and the shark looks I don't know, maybe give or take five metres, I reckon. That is like, that's like a megalodon. <laughs> I used to dive here when I was young. Dive, grew up here fishing. To see that in there, it was just crazy. And the scariest part was that it was only metres from surfers and swimmers. There's the beach. <laughs> yeah, so this um, popular beach, this corner where everyone like comes down, surf, swims, sort of dives, families and that. There's Bulli Beach. <laughs> Go for a swim. The closest we've seen it would probably be no more than like 50 metres out max, so riding the waves, it was like the back of the waves where you'd be surfing. Car, that is huge. If that shark grabbed hold of you and wanted to wanted to eat you, I'd you'd never have a stand a chance. The force, how big its mouth, how big its teeth were, the power, it's gonna be all over. You're done. If that wants her, you're done. Holy shit. The submarine. <laughs> the shark, yeah, was just circling around, like circling around us for, yeah, a while. We're just sitting there, and he's doing laps of the boat. Yeah, it's coming right here. The boys were able to get a close-up look as the shark circled their boat. And then Come it around. got a little bit oh. too close. Oh, 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 Boom, shook us all in the boat. Jake started screaming out, ah! And I went, holy shit. <laughs> oh, 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 you <laughs> And then it sort of come around, thrashed its tail a bit, and then sort of just disappeared for a moment. And it was just the power of it, even just shaking the whole boat when it grabbed the motor, it was just intense. Intense, like the power. I couldn't imagine being in the water that grabbed hold of you. You just have no chance. He's a dinosaur. For Joel and Jake, the confrontation has been an eye-opener. Yeah, it was a once-in-a-lifetime event for me. I've been waiting years and years and years to see one and then finally see one and one that big in the location where it was and the whole event, the whale carcass. This is awesome. Oh, he's come back from oh, no. oh. <laughs> The big white point is the pinnacle of sharks, I think.
The deaths and attacks of 2020 have left families and friends devastated and experts baffled. In other times, calls would be made for wholesale catching and culling of sharks. These days, we have a better understanding of the animals and the technology to help keep people and predators apart. One of the key strategies is drone surveillance on beaches. The Australian Unmanned Aerial Vehicle Service runs the largest coastal drone surveillance program in the Southern Hemisphere, operating in 61 locations. Bo is one of their pilots flying drones on the far north coast of New South Wales. First priority is to switch the, the siren on, on the drone, notify all the water users in the area, evacuate them from the water, and also notify lifeguards as soon as possible, all the surf lifesavers that are on with us so they can switch on their shark alarms as well and bring everyone in from the water. Bell in the traffic, unmanned RPA operating two nautical miles. We just continue to do surveillance flights to monitor the shark which way it's tracking, where it's heading, its behaviour. Drone technology definitely is a lifesaver. And a recent incident demonstrates this. Professional surfer Matt Wilkinson was in the water surfing at his local break, Sharps Beach. Bo was on patrol. I flew up to the, um, up to the northern end of Sharps Beach, just out past the, uh, the break zone of the waves. Almost immediately, just after I got out past there, a dark shape came out of the deep water, was cruising south down the beach. I noticed that it was tracking towards surfers, so I put the, uh, the alarm on, I notified the lifeguard as well to close the beach, get everyone out of the water. Bo kept a close watch as the shark tracked south. The concerning part was that once it got next to a, near a surfer, it sort of spun back around and started to approach it from behind. It all happened so quickly, like I believe um, from the moment the shark came out of the deep water, it was, it was next to Wilco within 10 seconds. And then another five seconds from that it disappeared, you know, so it, it swam quite quickly towards the surface, spun around behind Wilco and then uh, almost touching him, came within like a, a centimetre of him I'd say, and then it just darted off. For Bo, watching it unfold in real time was nerve-wracking. It's especially, especially frightening when you see them spin around what could be described as maybe like a, an attack pattern or something like that. So what I did was I dropped down over Wilco and I had the siren playing to try and get his attention to get him to come in as, as, as soon as possible. Back on the beach, Bo showed Wilco how close the shark had come. As soon as I saw, saw the footage, I was like, knew it was me, and then I uh, saw it like coming towards me, and I was like, whoa, it's like, must swim straight under me. And then when it came around, my heart just like sunk. It was such a, I don't know, like a, just a weird, sickening feeling to see it like come around the back of me, so it knew which way I was going knew I had no idea it was there. I don't know whether it changed its mind on the way up or whether it was always just having a look. Over the years, I have seen, seen a lot of sharks. And obviously, some have freaked me out. Some have seemed like they're just cruising and I've felt comfortable. But um, it is a bit weird that the one that I didn't see was the closest and, and has kind of hit, hit me the hardest. And, uh, yeah, I guess it'll stay with me for a long time. Drones are now an integral part of the arsenal to keep Australian beaches safe. Shark nets also play a part, but are indiscriminate killers. Personal electronic shark deterrents are popular, but have a limited range. Researchers are now catching sharks on smart drum lines, then tagging and releasing the animals. These tags ping satellites that warn swimmers of the nearby danger via a phone app. 2020 was a shark shocker, but Australia's love affair with the ocean isn't likely to end soon. And there's always new tech just around the corner.
So this is a new wetsuit material, and it was invented by a Aussie inventor named uh, Hayden Buford. And uh, the material is called Shark Stop. Basically, a shark cannot bite through it. And this very well could be a, a game changer for not only spearfishing, diving, but surfers, bodyboarders. In wearing something like this, a shark will never be able to do what that shark did to me. You might get a few punctures. You might get some bruising. He might even break a bone. But there's no way he's going to go through this material and have a catastrophic injury like what I had. Are you optimistic about getting back in the water? I'll go. I can't give it up. I've been doing it for 50 years now. If you take that away from me, I might as well be just dead.